Hey guys, we've got a really interesting video today. Out of nowhere, Ambernick released an Android 11 update for their RG552 handheld, and it brings with it some interesting features. This update brings fan control, screen mapping support, and CPU overclocking. In this video, we're going to take a look at the changes and see if the new CPU overclocks improve the emulation ability of this device. For those wondering, I grabbed this update from Ambernick's Facebook page of all places and flashed it to an SD card to update and replace the stock firmware that came with this device. With this update, the specs of the device have changed since the last time I did a video on it, so let's quickly go over the important points. The RG552 comes with the RK3399 CPU. It has two Cortex-A72 cores clocked at 2.2 GHz with the overclock and four A53 cores clocked at 1.4 GHz. Our GPU is a Mali T860 MP4 and it is clocked at 800 MHz. This is a pretty big overclock over the stock firmware that I reviewed last year, so I'm excited to see if this will improve the emulation ability of this device. Here we are in the Android 11 system on my updated device. I have installed a few apps here, but I do want to point out that this device comes with some paid emulators and some other low quality ones that you probably will never want to use. The strange thing this time around is that the device does not come with a cracked version of Yabasan Shiro 2, even though we have a cracked version of Drastic and Mupin 64. It's also worth noting that even though the system comes with emulators already installed, they are not all configured for use out of the box, and some of them are fundamentally broken, like the EtherSX2 emulator. This update also does not have Google Play support, and I'm not sure why they even bothered to make this image without it. The stock firmware also didn't have Google Play support, so there's not much to say, except that you can easily install all the apps that you'll need with the Aurora Store. If you're still on the stock firmware that came with this device, I would just say to just upgrade to this Android 11 build, because it is a lot better than the original Android system. I would normally use gesture support on a device like this. Android 11 has gestures, and they work well on bigger devices like the RG552. Unfortunately, they do not work well in this current build. You can do the swipe up from the bottom gesture without any problems. Let's say, for example, that I want to download Netflix right now. One of the gesture commands that you can do is to swipe over from the right or the left to back out of one screen. It actually doesn't work. Even if you set the sensitivity to the maximum level, it doesn't work. You need to go up from the bottom, and then you can swipe over from the left. It's just not worth doing that, so I have to use the other screen option. Another thing that I want to point out is that the gamepad controls seem to be broken for some apps. I almost did not include this footage in this video because I wasn't sure if I had tested dead cells on this device before, but I looked back at my original RG552 video and saw it running without issues. It is completely broken right now, and I'm not sure why. Screen mapping works fine, and it isn't on for this clip, so I don't know why this game cannot use the controls. It's just something that I want to point out. While we are on the topic of controls, let's go over the screen mapping functionality in this update. Here we are in Arena of Valor, and I do not have mapping turned on. We can enable the controls by swiping down from the top, and then we'll have this window. Now the funny thing about this is I actually had this saved, and it didn't save. So we'll have to go through what it would be like right now to make a new one. So we are going to make a new config, and we're going to select Use to modify it. And if we go over to the button configuration, we can turn off things that we don't need. Let's enable this stick and put it there, and get some basic things going. Let's re-enable these. Let's put X here, Y here, A here, and B here. This big window is kind of annoying, and even though it can move, it takes up a lot of the screen space. Okay, and let's save the changes. So now the profile is saved, and we've got everything that we need mapped. To turn it on now, we need to use the switch option at the top. Now it's activated. If we close this window, you will see that I can turn around. My ping is pretty high right now because I'm playing on a VPN, so I will just say that normally this isn't a problem at all. I've played this game for about two hours or so, and the performance was not bad. So the only thing that I will say is that it does work, even if it has limited use on this device. It's not going to be as good as some of the other options, like Retroid, Mochi, or Odin. If you try to touch the screen, you will kill any action that you're already doing, and you'll have to re-enable it. This is kind of the same thing that you'd see on the GBDXD and the X18S, but it's better than nothing. One thing that I want to point out before we jump into the emulation section of this video is that the company completely fixed one of my biggest annoyances with using this device for low-end systems that already run well on the weaker RG351. 
We now have a few different fan modes that we can switch between, and I love the option of turning this off completely when I'm not going to be playing anything that will make the processor that hot. This is significantly better than it was last year when the fan could ramp up to high levels just by doing some simple 2D emulation. The first system that we're going to take a look at is PS1 with the Duck Station emulator. By default, this is going to be set to 1x native resolution, but there are some games where you could raise this to 2x without any issues for better picture quality. In some 3D games, this is most likely going to be out of the question, even with the overclock. The next system that we're going to look at is GameCube with the Dolphin MMJR1 build. I have to say, it's not immediately evident if the overclock is having any impact on the performance here versus what I saw last year. Games that were slow before are still slow now, and you'll probably have to dig deep to find some playable titles, but they are out there. Let's move over to 3DS with the Citra emulator. I wasn't expecting to see any improvements here because this system is very demanding. These games are all set to 1x native resolution and I'm using the latest Dolphin MMJ build. The two Zelda games were the only titles that ran decently, but I would not consider using this device over a cheaper 3DS or a 2DS. Our next system is Dreamcast with the ReDream emulator. This system already ran well last year, but I still wanted to include it. There are a bunch of Linux options for this device right now, and Android is your best bet for Dreamcast on the RG552 if you want to play things that did not run well on the RK3326. I was hoping that our CPU overclock would be enough to play N64 games with my preferred emulator for widescreen devices. We can play some simple games like Diddy Kong Racing with the wide adjusted setting, but we are limited to 1x resolution and it doesn't look good on a screen this big. If we switch over to Moopin 64, we can bump up the resolution and more games are playable. While filming this section, I ran into one strange bug that I wasn't able to fix. Occasionally while playing an N64 game, the system would completely freeze up and the only way that I could fix it was by going into the multitasking view before going back into the game. I wanted to make sure that this wasn't a fluke with one game, so I tried out another title. While playing that game, I found out that I could break from the lag by moving the analog stick around in a circle, but the problem would still happen later on. Not really sure what's going on here, but I wanted to point it out.
Next up we have PSP with the PPSSP emulator. By default, this is going to be set to a 2x native resolution. For some simple 2D and 3D games, you'll be fine with this setting, but you will need to drop that down to 1x for some bigger 3D ones. And our last system is PS2 with the Ether SX2 emulator. This is something that was not possible to test last year due to the old Android version that ships with this device. After testing some SBCs with this chip, I did not have high expectations for the RG552, but I still wanted to check if that overclock made any improvements. Even with the 2.2 GHz overclock, most PS2 games are not going to be playable on this device. I'm sure if you dig around enough, you might be able to find some playable games but you'd probably be better off just streaming PS2 games from your PC to the RG552 to save your battery life and your sanity. That's it for this showcase on the Android 11 update for the RG552. Ambernic is not one to provide software updates for their products post-launch, so it was really cool to see that they spent the time getting this build out the door. I would still say that this price is a bit crazy for what is on offer here, but to each their own. This is set for around the same price that RK3588 handhelds will go for, and that processor is a lot better than this one. Maybe one day you'll be able to pick up one of these for cheap, and if you do, you'll be able to use this new Android build. Happy gaming everyone, talk you out.